uh, five, good morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm Manaswi. I am uh, one of Gregorio's PhD students at UIUC. Uh, and today I'll be talking about uh, Medicaid, which is an effort to uh, obtain correct by construction medical guidance systems. Um, and this is a uh, joint work with uh, Professor Louis Shah's group uh, at UIUC. Uh, and I've also had inputs from uh, my team at FSL, uh, especially from uh, Nishant Rodriguez. I don't know if he's on the call, uh, and Grigore. So, uh, yes, and uh, a disclaimer before I start the talk uh, I am, even though this will contain a lot of medical information. Uh, I'm not a medical professional. I am a CS student. So do not rely on this for uh, medical advice. Uh, and the second thing is that uh, this, this language is still very much in development. Uh, so at any point of time, if you have any suggestions about the language, then please feel free to interrupt and stop me and say, OK, you know, I think you can do this better. Uh, that would be of immense help. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, so I want to get started by uh, with an with an example. So suppose you have an emergency department at a hospital, and uh, this emergency department uh, receives a a patient uh, who has some sort of an infection or some abnormal stats, for example, like elevated blood pressure or uh, an abnormal heart rate, or maybe uh, an abnormal uh, capillary response or maybe an infection like COVID-19. Uh, one of the things that you need to do at the ED, so one of the things that the medical professionals will have to do, apart from treating the underlying condition, is to check whether the person has sepsis or not. Um, so sepsis is essentially an extreme reaction of uh, the immune system to an infection. Uh, it basically is a condition where your body goes into overdrive uh, and your immune system starts attacking the body itself along with the infection. And it's an extremely dangerous situation, which if not handled correctly, can lead to, well, fatalities. Uh, and any infection can lead to sepsis. Uh, it can be uh, a cut that, de that develops a bacterial infection or COVID-19. So if anyone presenting essentially at uh, the emergency department uh, has potential for having sepsis. Uh, and this is a major problem. It's been recognized as a major problem by both the CDC and the WHO. Uh, and in the United States alone, each year, uh, the, the data that uh, the CDC quotes is uh, around 270,000 deaths are attributed to sepsis. And in 2011, so this was more than 11 years ago, uh, according to the CDC, $20.3 billion was, were spent on uh, management of sepsis. Uh, in fact, the CDC goes into details of like uh, what sepsis is and how to treat it for regular people, how you can recognize it uh, so that it, you, it can be prevented. Um, and also, by the way, yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure what the, uh, the, the format of the talks are, but please feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions at any point of time. OK, so moving on. So sepsis is essentially uh, time critical. Uh, if you can detect it early, then you have the, the chances of the patient's survival improve significantly. Uh, so early detection is important. So one of the ways that hospitals deal with situations or conditions like sepsis is by coming up with these uh, guidelines uh, that you can see here on the left. Uh, so these are called best practice guidelines. They are produced by hospitals or the top doctors at the hospital or medical or medical organizations, for example, uh, the American Heart Association. And they codify what the optimal or best treatment would be uh, in case of such situations. So for example, this guideline on the left is, uh, is a guideline to, to screen a patient uh, for sepsis. And I'm deliberately presenting this particular guideline because this is not a toy example. Uh, this 
is a guideline or a part of the guideline that is being used at uh, the pediatric emergency department at OSF hospital here in Champaign. Um, and you, that's why, you know, it might be a little hard to read, uh, but I wanted to work with an actual example and not with some toy example. Um, so what it says is uh, if you have a patient who that presents with, you know, some infection or subabnormal temperature or abnormal statistics, the first thing that you do is you get the patient age. And if the patient has any high risk conditions, for example, like cancer, and then you obtain patient vitals. Um, these vitals are things like the heart rate, the systolic blood pressure, uh, the capillary refill, uh, the temperature. Basically, most of these things that would be available via sensors. So the nurse or the doctor on duty at that point of time would have to attach uh, these sensors to the patient to get these data to get this data. This data over here would be available just by you know asking the patient or uh, looking up uh, uh, patient records that the hospital might have in their database, and then you go into this uh, this state where uh, you screen the patient for sepsis. Um, and essentially what it says is that if the patient falls in one of these three buckets, then the patient should be flagged as potentially septic. Uh, and bu the buckets themselves aren't important here because I'm not trying to present, you know, how to screen a patient for sepsis, but like what the guideline, what such guidelines do. But at, what, uh, at a higher level, what you can see is, Bucket one says, does the patient have an abnormal heart rate? Uh, and checking if the patient has abnormal heart rate would require you to look at this table over here, where in the first column you have the age, and in the second column you have the heart rate. Uh, and similarly for the respiratory rate and other signs, you have these tables that you need to go through. And based on these tables, you would characterize the patient in being in one of these three buckets, one or multiple of these buckets. And if that's the case, then you treat the patient, uh, you flag it and um, flag him as, sep uh, as what is possibly having sepsis and you treat the patient for sepsis. Otherwise, you continue the regular triage. You know, remember that he pre the patient presented with uh, some abnormal, some abnormality or an infection in the first place. Um, so uh, the, the way that these guidelines work is the hospital would have essentially these paper guidelines in the emergency department and the, the healthcare professionals would be trained to read them and perform these, these procedures when they have a patient coming in. And uh, manual screening can result in increased preventable medical errors, right? And these errors can happen because the medical professional might be overloaded, uh, they might be at the end of a long shift. Um, there might be conditions, for example, in the case of uh, COVID-19, the pandemic, that uh, the hospitals were just flooded with people and uh, every, every professional was dealing with too many patients, so he couldn't potentially have uh, enough time to follow the guideline. Uh, you could make an error in reading these charts and checklists. Uh, if you look at this chart, uh, you could possibly just read one column wrong uh, or a row wrong and uh, might screen someone for uh, might screen someone wrongly and you know not treat them for sepsis when they they might have sepsis uh, and there might be an ambiguity in comprehension of these guidelines themselves you know they these guidelines as you can see they're written mostly in English um, they're produced by people who are not uh, who are not computer programmers. Uh, so, so there is obviously scope for ambiguity over here. And these guidelines keep changing. Hospitals keep updating them. Um, uh, medical organizations keep coming up with newer guidelines and keep updating these guidelines as they perform more and more research on how such conditions can be best managed. So you might have a preventable medical error in the case where a guideline has been updated, but the hospital staff hasn't been trained to follow the updated guideline or simply the updated guideline hasn't been you know provided to the emergency department so one way to to sort of mitigate these uh, manual screening errors would be to come up with uh, digital systems or essentially you know computer code that can automate some of this stuff 
and these systems are essential are called clinical decision support systems because uh, they're supporting the healthcare provider uh, making certain decisions like whether the patient has sepsis or not uh, so in this simplified diagram i'm sort of describing what these clinical decision support systems are so you have a patient and you have the electronic health record of that patient and this clinical decision support system essentially would take in the patient data uh, available via sensors so the heart rate the systolic blood pressure things like that uh, take an input from the medical professional uh, pre existing conditions uh, the mental status for the patient patient for example and read uh, the health records that are already available and then make some sort of decision or treatment suggestion and provide it to the healthcare provider who can then provide it to the patient and then you know this process continues the the statistics of the patient might change uh, which you know updates uh, the decision that the clinical decision support system is making and the suggestions can change uh, and these clinical decision support systems have already been implemented uh, and depending on the guideline and uh, the, the the system itself uh, it has been shown there is a lot of research that, that suggests that these systems actually do help uh, substantially in decreasing these preventable preventable medical errors so such systems do work um, and the thing is this i've just presented sepsis sepsis is just one example uh, but there are guidelines for different procedures uh, card cardiac arrest for example has a guideline that is published by the american heart association which looks very similar to sepsis in its flowchart like representation uh, covid 19 uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome management has a guideline that was published uh, in in reputed journals um, and these are published by healthcare experts and periodically updated uh, in the case of covid 19 uh, if you remember at the start of the pandemic uh, when people started getting to a stage where ventilator support was needed um, uh, we started running out of ventilators but then the industry responded and ventilators became more and more readily available so we ended up in a situation where we had a lot of ventilators but that didn't necessarily fix the problem because the problem was that there weren't enough people who could handle these hand ventilators you didn't have enough people who knew how to use a ventilator properly on a patient who had uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome with covid where the lungs are severely damaged um so i was talking to some people in india who said it doesn't sometimes it doesn't even matter if uh, if the guideline or the clinical decision su support system is perfect or correct uh, the fact that sometimes just these systems don't exist is a problem so uh, there are places around the world where the infrastructure might be available for example you might have a ventilator but the healthcare professionals are just not there there is manpower shortage so even having imperfect systems can help uh, because not having any system at all is certainly going to lead to a fatality. Having an imperfect system might still be able to save lives. Um, but the problem with uh, clinical decision support systems that are implemented in an ad hoc way, you know, in some programming language, uh, is you know the, the problem that most programs have. They might have implementation bugs. Uh, another thing that happens in this case is that the semantics that the programmers interpreted by reading the paper guidelines may be different from the actual intended meaning of the semantics. Uh, these systems are implemented by programmers who are not healthcare professionals. Uh, and the semantics that they understand are may be different from the semantics that the healthcare professionals actually wanted them to understand. And then when the guidelines change, which does happen quite frequently, you would need to update the system uh, and that again leads to a problem where you know the guidelines and the system may not be in sync anymore uh, so the the question that we're asking is uh, why can't we just have an ideal world where this clinical decision support system uh, is sort of the guideline itself why can't we have a framework in which you can specify the guideline as a healthcare professional and then that specification is enough to give you a system that essentially does the decision support part 
uh, why do we need to go through the step of implementing it in a programming language separately and then uh, validating it somehow uh, and having potential for bugs or for you know these systems being out of place out of sync with with the actual intended guideline so this is the ideal vision that essentially uh, medica is essentially trying to get to uh, we're trying to get to a, a place where you have this one language that is sort of specific or tailor made to uh, write these decision support systems in and then they are correct by construction um, so uh, the first problem that we we ran into uh, when we started looking into this was uh, formalizing these medical guidelines uh, as i was saying earlier that these guidelines are mostly expressed informally using like flowchart like notation um, they're expressed by people who are not computer programmers uh, there is no ambig unamb unambiguous or standard method for handling patient data in fact in most cases there is no distinction being made between the patient data and the data associated with the treatment they just sort of mixed together in in one guideline uh, and for you know these ad hoc clinical decision support systems implemented in some programming language the way these are validated is uh, by essentially hospitals go through simulation so they you would have uh, a dummy patient uh, with simulation based data and you would test the guideline on that and if the guideline works for enough patient enough you know simulations then you sort of assume that it's going to work in the real case and you move the guideline uh, you move the clinical decision support system uh, to your emergency department or to your icu wherever you need it um, but that's just testing there is no a lot of the times there is no formal validation occurring over here um so some of the work that we are building on is called computational pathophysiology and uh, this was work done by uh, mariam rahman harris uh, who was also at rv for some time uh, and she and professor shah group shah's group uh, at uiuc uh, worked on a way of formalizing these medical guidelines using finite state machines uh, to model both the patient state. Uh, so the patient has all of these organ systems. For example, uh, you have a cardiovascular system uh, where data associated with the heart, like the heart rate, the systolic blood pressure, the capillary refill, uh, the, and, you know, the diastolic blood pressure would be, uh, you would have a liver uh, finite state machine or uh, an immune system finite state machine where things like the patient temperature would be and then you have a treatment machine that's the part that actually uh, the medical professionals care about that's the part that you want them to see uh, the other part about how you are getting the data should be hidden under the hood and these these patient organ state machines can be arbitrarily complex uh, so you can get to a point where you can start uh, modeling them not just at finite state machines, but as hybrid automata, where you would essentially have uh, uh, differential equations specifying uh, the, the dynamics of the organ itself. Uh, and then you could do things like, you know, treating one of these machines is essentially transitions in this hybrid automaton. Uh, and communication, these are inherently concurrent systems, obviously, uh, you know, the heart and the lung, for example, run at the same time. And the communication between these machines is basically facilitated by passing events between each other. Uh, and I'll go into more details on how that works. Uh, but, but that's the basic idea behind uh, computational pathophysiology, which is coming up with a way of formalizing these informal guidelines. So like going back to our, our uh, sepsis screening example, uh, this is the informal guideline on the left that we have. Now you can see that there is patient data here that has mixed or jumbled together with the treatment data. Um, so uh, it, the first step that we need to do is we need to be able to separate out the patient data with the treatment data. And uh, we would need essentially multiple finite state machines to model patient data. So we would need a cardiovascular machine 
that would keep track of things like the heart rate, the blood pressure, the pulse quality, the capillary refill. You would need an immune system machine that would keep track of the body temperature. You need a patient machine which can keep track of you know the age, the high risk conditions that the patient have, and then there is the treatment machine which is going to keep track of the main uh, sepsis detection logic, uh, which is this part over here. And one other thing of note over here is that the data is not the, the data itself has uh, certain characteristics. For example, things like the heart rate and the blood pressure, and the pulse quality. These are available periodically. You have sensors that can give you this data every few seconds. Uh, same is the case with the body temperature. So you need some modeling mechanism that can take the dynamic data nature of this data into account. Uh, but things like the age or the high risk condition that the patient has uh, does not change periodically uh, in the scope of, for example, the treatment. We don't expect uh, the age of the patient to change periodically, right? And uh, well, the treatment machine is essentially uh, just, just specifies how the patient should be treated, right? Uh, so this is uh, one of the ways you can go from uh, an informal guideline that we have on the left to a more formal and systematic way of modeling such a system. So you would have a cardiovascular machine over here on the left. And what this machine would do is it would, uh, every few seconds, obtain the heart rate, the systolic blood pressure, the pulse quality, and things like that. Uh, and it would essentially keep, stay here in a loop until it's asked to stop. Similarly, you would have the immune system machine that would get the body temperature from some sensor. Uh, and you would continue with this uh, until you would essentially stay in this one state of the machine until you are asked to stop. Um, and then you would have a patient finite state machine, uh, which would you know keep track of the high risk conditions, the age, things like the skin condition of the patient, which you need in this case of sepsis. Uh, and obviously the patient has a heart and an immune system. So it would create instances of these machines uh, and keep track of them. Uh, but there is no loop over here because the data doesn't change. Uh, so this is, by the way, this is a simplified, these are simplified organ machines uh, for, for the case of sepsis screening, but they can be arbitrarily complex. So you can have a heart machine that has multiple states uh, and you can be in different states depending on what what the status of the heart is. Um, one of the ways of thinking of them is have their abstractions of the actual organs in the real world. Uh, so the, in, in one of the, the terminology used in real time systems is digital twins. So they're essentially digital representations of real systems or real organs that the patient has. Um, so you could have a heart machine in for a particular procedure, let's say for cardiac arrest, which has multiple states. Um, and uh, state transitions would essentially happen because of events occurring from the treatment machine. So for example, you might inject a drug into the bloodstream that changes the heart state, and that would trigger a transaction in this state machine over here. And that transact, that triggering would happen by the treatment machine essentially sending an event to the heart machine. In this case, we don't need that. So, you know, there is one treatment machine that's not directly interacting with any of these machines. Uh, and what it does is the first step uh, is that it obtains the age and the high risk conditions, uh, which was the first part over here. The second thing is it obtains the patient vitals, which is the part over here. And the third thing is that it has the sepsis detection logic, which I have sort of, uh, which would be the part over here in this state of the finite state machine, uh, which I have uh, grayed out a little bit because it was hard to depict over here, but I will go into more details of this. And then you have outgoing transitions uh, based on whether or not you have you detected sepsis or not. So ideally, all of this part is hidden from the healthcare provider. Uh, you The only code that the healthcare provider needs to see uh, would be the part over here in the, on the lower end. Uh, the part on the upper end is hidden from him because they don't care about how you're getting the data. They just care that the data is available and the quality of the data is appropriate for uh, the treatment being performed. 
So, for example, the heart rate or the systolic blood pressure is up to date to a relative degree. Uh, so, this is uh, uh, this the computational pathophysiology way is a good way of achieving this separation between the patient state and the treatment state. And then, when you are presenting uh, guidelines to, let's say, healthcare providers, you just need to present the treatment state. The patient state itself uh, can be hidden under the hood, and in fact, ideally should be reusable. So you can have multiple guidelines that just import these machines and reuse them. So uh, going into what Medicaid is, it's essentially a realization of computational pathophysiology. So it's a domain-specific language for specifying these finite state machines that is uh, very intuitive. Uh, so it is close to the existing natural language-based guidelines that uh, are already being used. Uh, it's formally defined. Uh, we think that semantics are a must for such safety critical systems because leaving the safety boundary in this case might actually mean a fatality. So uh, you need to make sure that your language has formal semantics and Medicaid does, it's defined in K. Uh, we want it to be well supported by a rich set of tools like deductive verifiers, model checkers, and proof object generators. Uh, and proof object generation, for example, in this case would be uh, particularly useful uh, because uh, in cases like litigation, where uh, hospitals are sued for not following a particular guideline, uh, if you have a Medicaid-based system that gives you a proof object that says, no, this guideline was formed, the, the professional followed the guideline correctly, and here is a proof of that, that you can check independently, then that can essentially may even serve as evidence uh, for, for following the procedure, cor procedure correctly or incorrectly. Uh, and we want this to be easily modifiable. Uh, uh, we don't exactly know what the best way of presenting this, uh, the, these guidelines to healthcare professionals are, uh, but we want them to be able to look at this code and understand it. Um, so, it should be easy to incorporate uh, syntax and semantic suggestions from healthcare professionals. Uh, so, so those are the goals of Medicare at this point of time. Okay. Um, so we did consider uh, other uh, alternatives for uh, formalizing uh, medical guide guidelines and two that were of note uh, were Yakindu, which is a modeling language for for hierarchical state charts. Uh, and the problem with Jakindu is that it's, uh, it is executable, but not directly executable. It essentially emits Java code that can be executed. Uh, doesn't have formal semantics or any analysis tools. Um, and it, it cannot be modify, modified in any way to, to accommodate healthcare professionals' recommendations. Um, in fact, like, I'm not even sure how the modification part would work because uh, for a lot of the constructs, the semantics are sometimes ambiguous. So it, we felt that this is not an ideal language for, for, for doing such, for expressing such critical systems. Um, another language is uh, P, which is, uh, uh, it's widely used uh, in the industry. Uh, for modeling highly concurrent systems. For example, it's used it at AWS to model their service-oriented architecture. Uh, it does have formal semantics uh, on paper. I think they were presented at Purple 17. And it is very actively de developed and maintained. Uh, but even P is not directly executable. It, it emits C-sharp code uh, that can be executed. And it does have a very good model checker, and it also has monitoring support now. Um, uh, in fact, I worked on ha having adding monitoring support for P uh, using RV Monitor, um, and but it does not have a deductive verifier. Um, this is something that the P team is actually trying to address. Um, one of the other things is that P is uh, it since it's meant to be used by programmers, it's actually statically typed. Uh, and that might be a problem for readability. So, so that's one of the reasons why we didn't end up choosing P. Um, but 
we did uh, essentially borrow some syntax from p uh, okay by the way uh, uh, are there no questions or like i just want to make sure i'm am i like audible or not hello i think that there were no questions until okay now. okay yeah i i thought you know i may i just want to make sure that i've not lost lost anyone <laughs> okay cool okay so i'll keep continuing um so uh i want to go a little bit into what medicare syntax looks like uh so to express a machine in medicare you would use the keyword machine give the machine a name uh and in essentially you would have uh a bunch of instance variables um this words this these instance variables are essentially the state of the machine itself um so for example if you are specifying the cardiovascular machine these variables would be things like the heart rate or the blood pressure uh this is standard if you've used p um then you have uh, a series of state declarations so finite state machine has multiple states you have a state declaration for each state you would give the state name to the state and every state has an entry block uh which can have some arguments that can be passed to it when you enter the state and then you have statements within that entry block it's essentially code that's always executed when you enter a particular state and then you have event handlers so you the way you specify an event handler is to say like on receiving a particular event with some data you do, do something you know do run some statements and for each state you would have a a a a, a, a bunch of such event handlers and each machines would push essentially have a bunch of such states and then these statements that you have over here essentially the code within end you know the entry blocks and the event handlers uh they can be assignments or conditionals or loops uh you can create instances of new machines uh we have sleep statements that we have we had to add uh to 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 k and i will go over the semantics of how we have done that uh you can send an event to another machine uh where you would say give the instance id of the machine that you want to send the event to the name of the event and the data that you want to send it to you can go to a state so you can go from one state to another state and there are two other instructions that are kind of special special to medicare the first one is what called obtain and the second one is instruct uh and the idea is that this allows us to have interactions with an external source so obtain would be something that is a keyword that you would use to obtain some data from an external source and instruct is the keyword that you would use to send some data out to an external source right okay so moving on okay so uh, going going ahead with this uh, sepsis screening example how would you implement sepsis screening in medicare so just to recap uh, we started with uh, we started with this informal guideline we came up with a way of having this formal representation or an unambiguous representation of this informal guideline where we have a clear distinction between the patient state and the treatment state now so this is still on you know this is still a, these are still diagrams now uh, let's look into how you can actually implement these machines in medicare and get a running system that does what you want it to do uh, so going ahead so this is the first machine this is the cardiovascular machine which basically uh, every few seconds is just as one state every few seconds uh, obtain the heart rate the systolic blood pressure and the pulse quality unless you are you stop and the way we uh, we express this in medicare is we would say you know uh, there is a cardiovascular machine that receives an event called stop uh, the instance variables are the heart rate the systolic blood pressure the pulse quality and i'll not go over the rest and when you in the initial state when you enter it uh you use this obtain keyword to say get me the heart rate get me the blood pressure get me the pulse quality and get me the capillary refill uh and you broadcast a machine update event 
for any other machine that wants to know that you know heart rate and all have been updated uh, and then you know you just send this to a continue event uh, on continue you sleep for a few seconds uh, so that you don't keep running in an endless loop and then you go back to obtain heart vitals right so you this thing this this the machine stays in this state uh, for 2 seconds and then it'll just continue and if you need to receive a stop event then you just you, you just stop so it's kind of we're trying to get to a one to one uh, uh, correspondence between the machine and the the textual the graphical representation and what we express it in medicare uh, one other thing of note is this init keyword this specifies uh, only one state would have init and that is the state that you want to enter um, this is essentially also uh, i think used in in p uh, to specify the entry state uh so any questions about this or i can go ahead uh so oh on obtain is uh this is the special keyword that i was talking about like it hides the details of how you want to get the data from so when we are doing for example symbolic execution the rule for obtain can just be uh have uh have a logical variable uh for op instead of obtain right uh for concrete execution uh the way things work in medicare right now is uh that this obtain uses the sharp system hook in medicare to to get a value from an external service um and uh, that that's how we get like this external service can essentially be a sensor uh or or you know some if you're working with dummy data it can just be you know some some dummy service that returns the the value that you're looking for uh, but yeah that's it's basically that's that this is as simple as it can be um similarly then let's look at the patient machine which has an instance of the cardiovascular machine uh it doesn't have a loop um but it has these two references to an immune system machine and a cardiovascular machine and it has to create these systems but it has like some some static data data that does not change across uh, across the the treatment timeline uh, and the way we express this in medicare is again like this is even simpler you say okay i have a heart you create a new heart which is the heart machine i have an immune system you create the immune system uh, the mental status is something that you would have to obtain uh, the skin condition you would have to obtain uh, and the age and the high risk conditions you don't have right now but when you enter uh, this when you create this patient machine these are things that you would have to provide to it uh, and this the reason why this is expressed this way is because if you look at the treatment machine uh, we we say that uh, obtaining age and high risk conditions is a part of the treatment machine and then you obtain the vitals and then you have the patient data that you need so this this essentially allows us to remain uh, consistent with the original guideline that uh, that the healthcare professionals have written, have provided to us um now finally uh, let's look at the treatment machine which is the last part uh, so we have all looked at the patient data part now let's look at the treatment data part the treatment part uh, so you enter the treatment machine and the first thing that you do is obtain the age and the high risk conditions uh so i'm in on this slide i'm just going to be dealing with this red part over here because that's the uh because that's that's what i can fit into one slide and the sex test de detection logic i will go into on the next slide um okay so we express this as we say uh let's we call it the sepsis screening machine it has a patient and the age and the high risk conditions that you would obtain so you enter this state over here the first state which is the obtain age and high risk condition state and you say okay op enter the patient age and then you would obtain it from some external source sim then you would say enter the high risk conditions and you obtain there from an external store and then you go to the state called obtain vitals right in the obtain vital state you create a patient where uh, you would pass in the age and the high risk conditions and if you remember if you recall that when you create the patient uh, you are also creating uh, references to the cardiovascular machine uh, right over here you are creating a reference card cardiovascular machine and the immune system machine right 
So this is how essentially you would obtain the vitals. Uh, and then you go to this sepsis screening machine. Now you have all the data that you need to essentially be able to perform this uh, detection logic. Okay, and then the sepsis, did the, if you can recall that this, the logic was expressed in this uh, informal paper guideline. Um, and the way we modeled this in Medicaid is like this, we would say, uh, you know, there is bar bucket one is if you have an abnormal heart rate or an abnormal blood pressure or an abnormal pulse quality. So if you see over here, bucket one says heart rate plus clarity or but if, uh, if any of these are abnormal, then bucket one is the patient is in bucket one. Uh, for bucket two, if the temperature is abnormal, then he's in bucket two. Uh, bucket three is it has a, a little, it's a little more complicated, but you say if the mental state is abnormal or if there are some high risk conditions, or this perfusion is essentially the scapular refill thing, which is a score that we have to calculate. Uh, and if the patient is in any of these buckets, then we say, you know, we sub uh, suspect sepsis and, you know, perform sepsis management now. Otherwise, you know, continue the regular treatment. You remember that patient presented with some, uh, some uh, uh, underlying condition in the first place or an, an infection. Um, so you just, go and treat the infection or the condition that the patient first came in with. And then you broadcast the stop event. And that stop event would essentially stop, you know, the heart machine. And you remember that these are running. So the heart machine and uh, the, the immune system machine. So you stop querying uh, these, these external services to, to get data from them, essentially. And uh, now the things like, we, uh, if you remember, like checking if the patient has an abnormal heart rate, uh, I'm sorry for the picture quality, but I've taken this from the actual guideline itself. So I'm gonna have enlarged it. So that's why it looks ugly, but essentially like, you know, based on the age of the patient, uh, these are the abnormal, these are the ranges where the heart rate would be considered abnormal. And uh, the way we uh, express this in Medicaid is we have this, in construct, which is essentially a macro that that that, that D sugars into if L statements. And we say that if the patient's age is in the interval between interval that's closed on the left between uh, you know zero days to one month, then if the patient is greater than the heart rate is greater than 205, then return that the heart rate is abnormal. And similarly, you have cases one case for one entry in the table. So we have each of these functions, for example, uh, abnormal blood pressure and all pulse quality, all of these uh, correspond to tables. And we have essentially these case analysis based uh, constructs that we use to be as close to the table as possible. So, um, so I am going to cheat a little bit here and I'm going to run the demo that we have uh, for this tool. But instead of running it directly, I wasn't sure if screen share was going to work. So I had a backup machine. Uh, so I had ran it beforehand and I you know, recorded it, my screen. So I'll just play it. Uh, so what you have on the left over here, on the right over here is a window which uh, essentially allows you to specify you know, patient parameters. So we don't actually have uh, sensors that can give us these values. So these patient parameters you can specify as, as um, you, you can just manually specify them. And on the left is something that the, the nurse or the healthcare provider would have in his or her hand, which is a tablet. And in that tablet, you would get these, these instructions over here. So this is a simpler uh, example. So in this case, uh, the first thing that the patient, the, that would appear on this tablet would be, you know, enter the age of the patient. Um, so, the, you, you would enter the age and then you would con continue. Then you go into this state, which says obtain the patient vitals. Uh, let's say there's no, there are no underlying conditions. Let's say the heart rate is normal. And in this case, you should have no sepsis. Uh, so that instruct statement would fire on in med the Medicaid code. And that was essentially shows, you know, something like this on, on, the, front, on the front end. So that's the demo for, for the no sepsis case. Uh, for the sepsis case, okay. Okay, so the same demo, but let's say, you know, we'll, we, we have some, some case where there is some sepsis. So again, 
you obtain the patient age. This time, let's put in a high risk condition. So that would automatically trigger sepsis. And let's set the heart rate to just a border value. Uh, and then you said submit. This creates the patient and then goes through that sepsis detection logic, the table that I had described earlier. And ideally, you would see something like this, sepsis is detected and start the treatment bundle. So, so we are in the process of implementing this for uh, OSF Healthcare right now. So this is the only the first part of it, which is the sepsis detection part. Uh, then uh, the 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 entire tool, the entirety of it, essentially, there are, there are more machines at the bottom that uh, tell you what to do, how you should deal with sepsis, like what's the sort of treatment uh, that you should provide. But obviously, like that was too much for the scope of this this presentation. So so I have omitted that part over here. Okay. Okay, so uh, the semantics. Um, most of the semantics of uh, Medicare are rather straightforward, like uh, cases like uh, you know conditionals and all of those. Those are just uh, regular in the sense that you know they're not, and there's nothing special about them that uh, we need to discuss. Uh, the only thing that the only semantics that are a little special are uh, these sleep statements. Uh, so for sleep, we had there is no uh, direct support in K at this point of time for sleep. Uh, so we use uh, we had to write some custom hooks and some C++ code to to essentially allow us to have these sleep statements. Uh, so what we do is uh, sleep essentially has uh, is uh, it rewrites to this sharp sleep, which is a hooked symbol, uh, and we wrote the C++ code for this hooked symbol. And what this does is it you adds a lib event timeout event with the specified duration that you want to sleep for. And then it stores that timer. And it basically, we are keeping a track of the number of timers that we have pending. Uh, once you're done with that, uh, the machine or the KSL that uh, has, that essentially is doing the sleep, it essentially waits on, uh, waits for a particular while uh, with the, timer ID that you are waiting on. Uh, then once the sleep is, you once you have a timeout event, uh, we remove the sleep weight with the timer ID, and uh, then essentially the KSL will be unblocked. So that machine which had sleep weight uh, will wait until sleep weight with the ID of the timer for the sleep uh, at the top of the KSL. It will wait until this particular timer ID appears as uh, a timeout event in a special cell called timeout events. And we reduce the number of timers that we have. And then that timeout events, uh, we have one rule where we essentially get all the all timeout events uh, at one point of time. So if we have any pending timers, then this rule fires. And we need to make sure this is a blocking rule. So it essentially, uh, will make lib event wait until at least one of the things have timed out. So we only handle uh, the sleep callbacks once all the other rules are done, uh, because this is going to be a blocking call. So we give this the lowest priority, essentially. Uh, so uh, once all the other machines, there is nothing else left to run, uh, we're assuming that you know all the other machines, like they, the other statements don't take any essentially any time. Uh, so there is no nothing else to done. Then we go and we check which of the timeouts have expired, and we essentially add uh, the timeout events. We, then we can handle the timeout events and you know unblock the particular machine uh, that had that ha that was sleeping. So th this is sort of the 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 way we implement sleep on a single thread uh, in in Medicare right now. Okay, and uh, so the other two semantic constructs that are of uh, note are these obtain and instruct uh, keywords. So these are keywords in the language itself. And the idea is that all of these medical guidelines, they don't necessarily, they, they don't talk about how you get the data from someplace or uh, you know how you tell something or how you instruct a medical professional about uh, and a procedure or an instruction that they're supposed to follow. Uh, so for concrete execution, right now what we do is 
uh, we assume sort of a service oriented architecture and we use sharp system uh, so for obtain uh, we use sharp system to essentially make a http get request to some service and get that data in into the medicare program and for instruct we do the same thing uh, but you would have a medical terminal on the other end uh, where you do a post request and you display the data data, data on the terminal um, so the, 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 this is how it's implemented right now uh, and certainly something that uh, we're not sure if the same semantics are going to remain uh, this way going ahead but yeah these are one of the the demo that you saw this is how it sort of operates okay so what are the limitations of medicaid uh, as it stands uh, right now so uh, as i was saying um, medicaid is uh, it's uh, it it it's still under development so we these are the limitations that we have recognized and some things that we want to address immediately sort of so asynchronous communication can only happen with it within medicaid right we cannot receive external data asynchronously so when medicaid needs some data it will use the obtain keyword to get that data but we don't have something we don't have a mechanism where uh, let's say a sensor can send data to a medicaid machine and it gets added to a you know the set of input events for that machine to support something like that we would need multi threaded support in medicaid uh, in k itself right uh, we had earlier considered using the blockchain clay plugin for it uh, but at this point of time we're not using it so uh, basically if the uh, interaction with the outside world in medicaid right now uh, happens on a on a on a synchronous way which is medicaid dictating when the data when it needs the data uh, and we cannot handle uh, gui related logic right uh, so we need an external like we need these external services running that we can query to get obtain the data and you know to to send the data to to show on a screen via these instruct statements and the problem is that medicaid based systems will always have a gui uh, so probably one of the things that we want to eventually address is have better way of handling this this gui related logic and then then there is no you know native support for timers uh, which we have implemented timers you know use, using some c++ code and these external hooks uh, but it's not even clear what the underlying matching logic semantics of these timers would be and then we can't generate like nice readable flowcharts from the code itself that we can show to medical professionals uh, and uh, we are still thinking about the ability to be able to reuse these machines across different guidelines uh, so for example once you've written uh, the heart machine or uh, or let's say a lung machine right uh, we need some sort of way to say uh, to use the same machine for both uh, you know uh, let's say treatment of cardiac arrest and treatment of covid both of them involve lungs right uh, but the the granularity level at which we need the machines can be different uh, so we need some way of uh, being able to have these machines at different granular granularity levels uh, and then we have further future ideas of uh, supporting uh, uh, differential equations within these machines so that we can have organ systems expressed as hybrid automata and not just as finite state machines um, so potential k enhancements uh, that would be nice uh, and would be helpful if added uh, or at least considered would be some sort of uh, asynchronous communication support uh, which is you know similar to what the k blockchain plugin does but have it as a part of k itself to be able to say when i'm specifying the configuration here here is an attribute instead of just saying stream you should be able to say uh, this is the port that i want to uh, you know listen on uh, and just having coming request to that port added to to to, to a list uh, to to the list that uh, that that cell has uh, the ability to build GUIs um, this is uh, I'm not sure what the best way of doing this would be I think there are some ideas where you could specify parts of the configuration connect parts of the configuration of K to parts of the screen uh, and then adding uh, to this to you know a cell that's connected to something in the screen would essentially amount to displaying something on the screen again this would also require some sort of multi-threaded support 
as you know you don't want your GUI to be blocked if uh, if we just have one single thread. Uh, some generic event support for uh, events such as timers would be nice. And then I think you know if you could generate posters or graphical representations of programs, uh, that would that would also be nice. Uh, so basically, in conclusion, uh, Medica is a domain specific language again for formalizing such best practice systems. It's executable. Uh, it's readable so that instead of doing this thing where you're just testing it with simulation data, you, uh, uh, you actually show it to medical professionals and they can verify it themselves. It has a rich set of enamel tools. It has formal semantics as game. And our vision or the aim in, in the long run is for it to become the standard or the, the, the only way that such medical systems are expressed. So whenever a guideline needs to be published by any healthcare professional or organization, they essentially end up using Medicaid. So yeah, that's uh, that's the presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Um, uh, any questions? Not questions, but yeah. comments. Two comments. Oh, oh mm -hmm. sorry, Ilya. Let me let me just say this quickly, and then you can ask your questions. Um, so two 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 things I particularly think are really interesting here. One would be, um, I mean, in terms of using our technology, the right to give uh, insightful feedback to uh, medical professionals. Right? So one would be to generate tests. Right? Can we generate tests that uh, that uh, you know stress test the medical guidelines? then show them to the doctor say look if a patient comes in this situation and you do this and you do that then the patient dies and then second and probably related if you can use symbolic execution right to to analyze and get uh, a better understanding right of the medical guidance and to see under what condition you know something bad can happen you know, maybe if you are about a certain weight and you have this particular condition with the liver and this particular condition with the uh, lung, then the guidelines shouldn't apply to you at all. Right? Uh, uh, or maybe if you put two different guidelines together, you mm -hmm. get into an inconsistency. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I think this this two particularly would be very nice. I, and probably also yeah, had... no, no hanging fruits, no hanging fruits right, for what we have. Proof object, yes, that's beautiful, long term, but I think short term we can actually get a direct impact in the field. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the I think the short term goal that we have in mind right now is to have uh, this the sepsis management case running uh, at a hospital here and and evaluate how it goes and then based on that uh, you know make make more suggestions but yeah the the combining guidelines things i hadn't thought of before uh, which which could be a, a, a big selling point uh, another big selling point that i think would be like the litigation case which is uh, being able to produce like proof objects to say no the guideline was followed uh, so that I know that the like litigation seems to be like an issue in the Medicare, the healthcare industry. So, uh, so just so that can help these professionals, you know, uh, fight cases. And Asbe, did you get access to the hospital? Did you watch nurses treating patients and things like that? Uh, I, I don't. But the uh, group that I'm also working with, uh, Professor Louis Shah's group, yes, they do have access. Uh, so the goal is to. Uh, to have the system uh, be be a part of a hospital setup uh, in simulation now, like this year. Right. Yeah, great, thank you. So that that is why also why I put, I had access to this guideline because you know it's that's uh, it's a part of what we are implementing to be evaluated at a hospital, right? So.
Uh, yeah, thank yeah, you yeah. for the talk. Yeah, let me ask yes, another question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so my question is about uh, maybe reusing uh, this approach to expand it and to apply to uh, actually other medical challenges. So what do you think? Uh, is it uh, difficult? Uh, uh, yeah, to expand it. And another the follow-up follow question is about comparison with the uh, other popular approach. Uh, for instance, uh, I heard a lot of uh, application of machine learning to similar problems to yeah, prepare a model, teach it, uh, yeah, and get actually uh, yeah, some results of uh, monitoring different uh, yeah, characteristics and so on. What do you think uh, about uh, maybe comparing these two approaches? Uh, which advantages uh, does uh, the K framework actually uh, have comparing maybe with yeah other approaches like machine learning, etc.? Mm -hmm. So uh, is it difficult to show its these advantages? Uh, yeah, to persuade so which way we can. Uh, yeah, so. I think so the first part uh, which is like can we adopt it for other uh, other systems I think that should be fairly uh, uh, like yeah I, I, it, we should be able to use it to model concurrent systems uh, fairly simply right like um, there are other like the one other language that does that is P um, and as you know I've, I've worked with the people who uh, who uh, develop P um, the the thing that we can't do at even at this point of time is it doesn't have like for example things like deductive verification that's something that they are developing right now uh, so yes this can uh, become uh, this can, BAM can become an alternative for for things like P uh, there are some disadvantages here uh, with respect to P for example Medicare is untyped uh, maybe and P is type which is nicer for uh, dealing with uh, you know things like nicer if you're dealing with actual uh, you know computer scientists who can who can read who are more familiar with code uh the second part about uh about using ai based techniques uh i don't necessarily think that we need to compete with ai based techniques uh i think that uh, this like you the idea would be to have uh, to have medicaid be the sort of safe part so we can always use we can have simplexes right uh, so a simplex architecture, which is uh, you know um, the the other group at UAUC that I work with, Professor Louis Shah's, uh, that was his work uh, entirely. So that uh, what that does is that uh, you have essentially two two different controllers: a complex controller or a simple controller, right? Uh, the complex controller can be your AI-based system, right? Uh, the, your machine learning-based system, uh, and your simple controller can be can be K, right? And you can have a monitor that is derived, let's say, from K itself, uh, that allows you to check whether taking the decision of the complex controller uh, would be safe or not. If it's unsafe, then you go to the safe controller, which would be like you know the Medicaid base, which is perhaps a little more. Uh, it, it's a little more conservative in its approach. Let's say you know it doesn't give the the dosage that uh, let's say an AI based system might suggest for for some medication right might be very high versus because you know it's been reading the patient dynamics and it thinks you know the patient's metabolism is uh, different from what the standard dynamics are uh, versus let's say uh, the K based approaches it's li literally written what the guideline suggests right um, so 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 we could use something like simplexes uh, to have like a you know a system that's still safe at all times. Uh, so I think the example that's used to explain simplexes is the uh, to think of it as let's say if you have uh, a quick sort that's unverified, but uh, bubble sort that's verified. So you know bubble sort is slow, but you know it's safe, right? Uh, and checking whether or not something is sorted or not doesn't take a lot of time, right? So you come up with a system where uh, you first use the unverified quick sort, which you know in this case would be your AI based system to 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 do something and verify whether it's safe or not and if it's not then you, you fall back on bubble sort which would be you know a Medi medicaid based implementation so i think like there are uh, they, they can work in tandem with each other so yeah 